The Lost Education of Horace Tate. Before 1954, just south of where we are, Fayette County, Georgia, did not offer sec secondary education to its black citizens. My grandmother taught in a one-room school until a school was built. This is in Peachtree City. My father, a son of Fayette County, was in the first graduating class of the Henry Hunt High School at Fort Valley. My grandmother, who also went to Fort Valley when people had to go back to school under those normal school days, along with aunts and cousins um, who taught at the Fayette County Training School for Blacks, which was established in 1955 until integration in 1968, my grandmother was a teacher of the year for that training school. Later, her daughter, for whom I am named, was now teacher of the year for the now integrated Fayette County Schools in 1976. I also, at some point, had the privilege of meeting Dr. Tate when he was a senator, and I talked to him about public libraries and how important public libraries were. I didn't know anything about his education background. I just wanted him to support libraries. He died in 2002. And I share these personal connections because what Dr. Vanessa Seidel Walker has done in The Lost Education of Horace Tate is to show through the notes and efforts of Dr. Horace Tate, an amazing 1943 Fort Valley graduate, and the executive <coughs> uh, leader of the Georgia Black Teachers Association, how with Dr. Tate's leadership, ordinary black teachers fought in very secretive, hidden, and under the radar ways and over many generations for racial justice for students across this state. Dr. Tate hid these notes to protect teachers because if you said too much, you could get in trouble uh, and would get fired. But he hid, these, he hid these notes. And what the notes revealed was that teachers, while they were getting paid less, that really wasn't what they were talking about. They wanted adequate classrooms. They wanted curriculum materials. They wanted access to what they knew was good education. Her research in Dr. Tate's hidden archives, file cabinets in attics, records retrieved from his home that his wife wished that he would have discarded, um, is remarkable. And while I can no longer ask my grandmother and aunts about these things, this book helps me appreciate what their professional lives were about and helps all of us understand that the fight for educational justice is fought mostly by unsung heroes day by day and over generations and generations. And what I hope this book will do will inspire others to continue. Dr. Walker is the Samuel Candler Dobbs Professor of African American Educational Studies at Emory University. She has a BA from North Carolina Chapel Hill and a master's and doctorate from, of education from Harvard University. For 30 years now, she has explored this segregated schooling of African American children and the hidden systems of advocacy that demanded equality and justice for these children. Her research has garnered a number of awards, including the Grawmeyer Award for Education and the American Educational Research Award, even in her early careers. She is currently the president of the American Educational Research Association. It is my privilege to present the Lillian Smith Book Award to Dr. Vanessa Seidel Walker for her work, The Lost Education of Horace Tate, which I hope all of you will purchase. Good afternoon. Thank you to all of you. I'm not 
five feet, so <laughs> it's a little higher. Good afternoon, and thank you to all of you for taking the time to come this afternoon. I'd like to pose a question for you because it's the question with which I had to contend um, now 18, 19 years ago. What do you do when someone who's dying asks you if you've been back to the building where you first met? Have you been back to the building, Dr. Tate, would say frequently in the last weeks of his life. I couldn't figure out why I would possibly need to go back to the building. I'd met Dr. Tate uh, at that building uh, two years previous. I had been with him for two and three days a week over the last uh, year at his home in the basement. I'd seen everything at the building, I thought, and I was going through files in his basement. Why would I go back to the building? And yet he was persistent. Have you been back to the building? It wasn't actually a question as much as it was a direction. I want you to go back to the building. I regret to say that each time my response to him was, no, Dr. Tate, I haven't been back, but I'm going. <laughs> and then he died on Thanksgiving evening. I saw him earlier that day. I didn't go back to the building until after the funeral when black teachers converged in a church with senatorial leaders in Georgia and the governor. A strange conglomeration of people that represented a career for him. I spoke. And then I went back to the building. I couldn't figure out what I was looking for at the building because, of course, he didn't tell me why I was going or what was there. He simply said, have you been back to the building? I asked his daughter, Harasina, we can tell he wasn't a boy. Um, <clears throat> I asked his daughter, Harasina, what is it that your father wanted me to see? I mean, it's been two years. We've been talking, he's been describing things I don't really understand because in my understanding about segregated schools, I've come to learn, I mean, I knew already that there was a resilience within the communities and that people were fighting against segregation in these school communities. I understood that. But when Dr. Tate talked, he talked about dark roads and principals and plaintiffs and girls and Thurgood Marshall, and I didn't know what he was talking about. Sometimes he would say things like, you know, as he got sicker, he'd say, you, you'll know how to put it together. And I would look at him, I didn't want to tell him, no, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I will not know how to put this together. It doesn't fit any historical box I know to put it in. What are principals doing talking to Thurgood Marshall or parents, it, nothing about what you're saying makes sense. And dark roads, you know, driving, dropping somebody off by the river and picking somebody else up in a funeral car, what are you talking about? I, I didn't know, but I, I kept listening because he clearly thought he was talking about something and I wanted to know. So if we'd had these conversations and we'd had them periodically for now two years and and I've been at the basement of his home for two years. Why do I need to go back to the, to the building? This Georgia Teachers and Education Association building, this building where he had been the executive director of these teachers who would meet in droves, literally thousands for annual meetings in Atlanta. This building he seemed to care so much about that he had actually purchased it after desegregation. I knew that, but I didn't know why he would have purchased this building. I knew I'd met him there, that it still looked like it looked in 1970, but why do I need to go back when I've been through everything there? Harasina said, uh, Daddy meant the attic. The attic? 
they have three floors, but I, what, what do you mean, an attic? And she explained very um, perfunctorily, you know where Dad's office is, right? I said, yes. You know the door behind the door in his office? I said, no. She said, well, there's a door behind the door in his office. Go through that door. And when you go through, you'll be in a little hall. And, and look for a door on your right. And when you go through that door, go down some stairs. But be careful, because the lights are out and you can't see. And at the bottom of the stairs, there's a hole in the floor. So make sure you don't fall in the hole in the floor <laughs> at the bottom of the stairs. And when you get at the bottom, just kind of weave around, and you will be in a, in a room, a big room. And, um, and then you'll see some stairs going upstairs. <laughs> and take, the, take those stairs upstairs. And when you get to the top of that landing, look very carefully, and you'll see the door to an attic. And go through that door, and, and uh, that's the attic. Well, this is 2002. If you will let your mind go back to 2002, you will remember that cell phones did not have flashlights on them. <laughs> right? And they didn't work very well. Of course, mine still doesn't, but that's just me. I'm not trying to throw AT&T under the bus. but. <laughs> So I'm with a cell phone that does not have a flashlight, and I'm by myself. Going through the familiar that I had explored with Dr. Tate into a completely new world. I don't know about you, but I actually don't like bugs, or snakes, or things that crawl. Clearly, I am moving from one building into another building that is attached. I now know that it's the building that the teachers first purchased from a physician in 1951. But I did not know it at the time. I did not know that the new building where I had been meeting him was literally attached to the old building. I, I, I'd heard Dr. Tate say, sometimes I would need to escape the press. Why does an educator need to escape the press? But I, I never thought to ask him how he got out. This apparently was the escape route that he used. When I meandered through this circuitous space, these circuitous spaces, and made my way to the steps leading to the attic, these steps are literally this wide. And that's not an exaggeration. And they are very steep. I remember standing there and thinking, do they hold weight? <laughs> I'm by myself with a cell phone that doesn't work. Am I going to fall? You know, I mean, I don't even know what's going to happen. Uh, but I'm the daughter of an old black preacher, and they used to say, uh, I believe I'll run on and see what the end is going to be. <laughs> and so I thought, well, I've come this far, so I may as well, you know, if I fall in, I fall in. Let's go see. And in the attic were all the files of the Georgia Teachers and Education Association. A full collection, carefully appended one to another, as though in the beginning they were being very careful, and then around on two floors, things just dumped. Magazines and books and the legal cases, right, with the parents' signatures in their original handwriting. Um, I felt a little like Fred Sanford. Remember Fred Sanford used to say, honey, this is the big one. <laughs> Remember that? I felt a little like that because I knew that here was the real story. The one that he started giving me a little bit and then a little bit more and then a little bit more, and then finally let me come to his house. And when I saw three file cabinets in his basement, I'm ecstatic. But it, there was a room across from that. And even the last time he was in the basement with me before he died, he said, um, I said, you know, it took you a long time to show me this stuff. And he said, come here. And he led me through the basement. He said, I have stuff hidden here and here and here and here. The story needs a storyteller. And 
while I thought I was learning those two years what the story actually was, in real time he was vetting me to decide whether or not I would be the storyteller. There are many researchers who've come before me. I've now read transcripts of what they sent back to him. But they never saw the fullness of the story. For whatever reason, I got the fullness. Now, why does it matter? It matters that Dr. Tate hid these materials because black education materials were mostly destroyed with desegregation. Come over here quickly, someone told Ms. Inez when I was writing my first book in this area. They are burning everything. And she managed to grab a few photographs and things that I have in their highest potential. I thought it was just the school level, but it's not just the school level. It's the organizational level where the records were also destroyed. I went into my own office, Mr. Palmer, Dr. Tate's comparable in North Carolina, told me when I interviewed him, the day after desegregation and my own files had been destroyed. If you take away a people's documents, you can write about them however you want. At some point, Dr. Tate hid the collection. And he decided to allow me to be the storyteller. It's an extraordinary collection because it rewrites our understanding of how we got here. I thought courageous parents, plaintiffs, smart attorneys, right, came together, we get brown, it's great. What I did not understand is that the vision, the acquisition of the plaintiffs, the money, the connections with the lawyers all happen through educational organizations where we take a community and a legal team, connect them, and step back. Dr. Tate's lost education helped me understand history differently, but Dr. Tate's lost education also helps me understand the present differently because I understand now that there are 100 years of struggle. We can document it through these files from Reconstruction right up to 1970. I understand now that, yes, access was critical. That's what these teachers wanted when they sacrificed to make sure we could have Brown v. Board of Education. But I also understand that the desegregation compromise that happened in 1968, that was implemented in 1970, forced them to exchange their strong advocacy organizations, the aspiration that they created in these schools for limited access. And I think if we are going to move forward, we have to figure out how to continue their road to access, but we must also, I think, have the courage to follow the directions of a dead man, step into a, a room, a place we never expected to go, and recognize that the formula for success for black children will rest on this tripod of access, advocacy, and aspiration. And we must never elevate one over the other, for the children need all three. Let me say this as I leave. Ms. Lillian Smith, whose book, Killers of the Dream, I've used in my classes, I discovered shared the stage with Dr. Tate at one of their teacher education meetings. It seems to me particularly fitting and appropriate that as he introduced and acknowledged her among black teachers, that today I would have the real distinct privilege and honor of being able to accept on his and their behalf that she now honors his legacy even as he honored hers. I thank you so very much for the opportunity to be here and for listening. Thank you.